uh, Jean Paul Sartre's philosophy. So this is not a very detailed uh, discussion on Sartre's philosophy because we are discussing him for only about at most two and a half hours. But we'll make the most of the two and a half hours discussing the philosophy of one of the most important uh, existentialist thinkers, one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century. So just an introduction, I'll be reading a quote from Ronald Heyman uh, from his book, Sartre, a biography, which uh, describes the personality of Jean Paul Sartre. He writes, Sartre felt most at home in cafes and restaurants where he could annex space by dominating the conversation and exhaling smoke. But like Kafka, he never felt more free than when he was writing, creating an imaginary space. Paper as magic carpet, pen as wand. After a paradisal infancy centered on the belief that he was beautiful, he systematically tried to reject his body, to reassure his mind that he had nothing to fear from sibling rivalry with his maltreated body, he consistently ignored all messages that his body sent out. He resisted fatigue, treated pain as if it were a challenge. To step up his productivity, he made reckless use of stimulants, taking sedatives when he wanted to relax. He resented the time he had to spend on washing, shaving, cleaning his teeth, taking a bath, excreting, and he would economize by carrying on conversations through the bathroom door. He had no personal vanity. When he smoked, when his smoke stained teeth began to decay, he refused to waste time on seeing a dentist. He took a measurable pride in his intellect. He got a golden brain, he said. And that's the personality of Sartre. But let's talk of Sartre, the philosopher. According to his various biographers, even Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre was a man obsessed with his own intellect to the neglect of almost all else. He was always certain of his own value to society as a philosopher and writer, always taking the opportunity to demonstrate his superior mind. Sartre untire, is untiring in his pursuit of philosophical reflection, literary creativity. But in the second half of his life, he became, an act, he became active in his political commitment, which gained him worldwide acclaim. He's regarded as the father of existentialist philosophy, and his writings set a tone for intellectual life in the years that followed the Second World War. Now, we know that the writings of Jean Paul Sartre did not only center on philosophy. He was also a literary writer and also a political activist. His early life, just so we can have a glimpse of the life of Sartre, which pretty much defined his intellectual life. Jean Paul Sartre was born on June 21, 1905 in Paris, the only child of Jean-Baptiste and Anne-Marie Sartre. His parents came from distinguished families. Jean-Baptiste Sartre was the son of Dr. Amard Sartre, a noted country doctor in the Dordogne region of France. Sartre's mother was the first cousin of Albert Schweitzer, the famous German missionary, also an accomplished author, in fact. Amar Sartre was a cynical and unhappy man. His, uh, Jean Paul Sartre's grandfather he had married the daughter of a pharmacist, and an impression her family was well positioned. Much like his grandson Jean Paul, it is clear that Amar cared a great deal about his social status. 
Amarn had written several medical texts and he published his first work in his early 20s. Anne Marie Schweitzer, John Pulsard's mother, was the daughter of Carl Charles Schweitzer, while the uncle of famed thinker Albert Schweitzer, Carl was famous in his own right. Carl had published several texts on religion, philosophy, and languages. In fact, Carl was the author of a series of texts in English, German, and French. So with two authors for grandfathers, John Paul Sard might have been destined to write. So writing was in the family, was in the blood of Jean Paul Sartre. So writing came very naturally to Jean Paul Sartre. Jean Baptiste Sartre and Anne Marie Weiss are married on May 5, 1904, in Paris. And both were truly in love. Anne Marie completed de completely dedicated to her husband. Both of their families seem to have been placed by the marriage. When Jean Paul was born, his father, Jean Baptiste, was away on a naval assignment that's actually in China. And upon his return, he was happy to see his son. Sadly, however, Jean Baptiste had contracted enterocolitis, an infection of large intestines, during his voyage to China. And he became ill in 1906 and was forced to leave the Navy. The young family moved to a farm near Inman Sard's residence. And one year after Jean Paul Sard's uh, birth, his father in 1906, at the age of 32, died. And Jean Paul Sard would later, later, later write The death of John Baptiste was my greatest piece of good fortune. I didn't ha even have to forget him because his father died when he was just one year old. After the death of Jean Paulsard's father, his mother, Anne-Marie, moved into her parents' home. And his grandfather was a strict man, dedicated to learning, while his mother pampered young Jean Paul. You can understand that he's the only one left for him, his only son. The years living in the Schweitzer house affected Sartre for his entire life. Anne-Marie and Jean-Paul, the mother and the son, shared a room in the Schweitzer residence. And Anne-Marie found herself treated like a child by her domineering father. And escaped his oppressive personality, she showered her young son with attention often treating him like a toy or a doll, the young Jean Paul Sartre. Carl Schweitzer presided over matters with his size and personality. His commanding voice intimidated others. Carl knew he was still attractive and sought to prove his virility at every chance. And as Jean Paul grew, he saw his released religious man conduct numerous affairs including with a former student. Anne-Marie came to dispense his father's behavior, as did her son. Curiously, the young Sard would engage in numerous affairs and empty relationships throughout his life. Physically, Jean-Paul was not attractive. From an early illness, Sard lost most of his vision in one eye. And these eyes seem to look askance, as if Sartre was not paying attention. Worse, it was clear the boy was destined to be short and awkward. And without his curly hair or curly long hair and fancy clothes, Jean Paul Sartre's ugliness was obvious even to his mother. Some children did not hide their disdain for young Jean Paul's appearance. His lack of physical size, however, and his odd appearance made him a target for abuse. And he began to show signs of vindictive and angry personality. Jean Paul's only comfort was his self-confidence. He knew he was smarter than other children. 
Carl also knew his grandson was smart. From seven generations of teachers, Carl was eager to tutor the young John Paul. In fact, Carl was quite proud of his little man as a student. And curiously, Sartre would deny in several essays and in his autobiographies that he had been taught tutored by his grandfather. Carl, despite John Paul's statements to the contrary, was an excellent tutor and was dedicated to his grandson's success. While he, when he was eight, Jean Paul Sartre received some puppets from his mother, which inspired him to write scripts and stage shows. He slowly gained a small group of friends, or at least children willing to tolerate him in return for entertainment. Sean Paul enjoyed the attention associated with his shows, and he had learned that people like a performer. When Germany declared war in 1914, John Paul Sartre was caught up in the frenzy of nationalism. He even wrote a short story about a young French private who captures a the Kaiser. To prove he is superior to the German, the young Frenchman challenges the Kaiser to a peace fight and wins. Jean Paul was writing constantly. He felt a sense of power and control while writing. In 1915, Jean Paul enrolled at the Lycee Henry IV, a well regarded school. At the school, he easily made friends and demonstrated an abundance of wit again proving that he is really smart. One teacher noted that Sartre possessed an excellent mind, but he lacked mental discipline. Jean Paul did not refine his thoughts. This is a personality trait that Sartre never outgrew. His mind would race from topic to topic, never focused long enough to refine a thought this tendency also resulted in careless errors. Now, the stepchild and the rebel. When Shart was 12 years old, his mother decided to get married. Again, and Shart viewed this decision as a, as a betrayal on the part of his mother. Shart had grown unusually close to his mother and demanded all her attentions. His mother has been a consolation of sorts from the tension between him and the dominant patriarchs in his family, which lasted for his entire life. And Sard rebelled against his grandfather, and he quickly rebelled against Nancy, his stepfather. He was constantly in trouble, fought with fellow students, often enough that he regularly served after school detention. He rebelled against his stepfather and his grandfather. His parents began to worry that the young Sard would become a thug or a common thief, or even worse. Sard stole money from his mother's room and then lied about doing so. And his behavior was too much for his stepfather to accept. So in 19 12 of 1920, Mansi, the stepfather, realizing that he could not control the young John Paul, decided to send Sartre to Paris to study at the Lycée de Henry IV. And Sartre would be a boarder at the school. Now, he studied at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. In August of 1924, Sartre placed seventh on the Nicole Normal Superior entrance exam, which are to this day very highly competitive. During Sartre's first year at ENS, he was one of only five students of philosophy. The Normal Yens, as the students of the Ecole were known, tended to study theology, psychology, and the classics and philosophy at least during the 1920s had fallen from favor being viewed as a topic without application 
and perhaps even to this day. Sartre enjoyed the study of psychology and studied and critiqued Freud throughout his writings. He read a lot of classics, classic literatures, and while he claimed that he did not read the classics while he was studying at the ENS, library records show that Sartre checked out hundreds of books, many of them classics. Reading hundreds of books gave Sartre a vast amount of information from which to construct his papers as a student. Unfortunately, Sartre was still a disorganized intellectually, and some of his teachers observed that Sartre would base papers upon theories he only partially understood and was quick to draw conclusions. However, despite this, his gift with words sometimes masks Sartre's ignorance or even intentional errors. His eloquence serves Sartre as a substitute for any depth of knowledge. Now, Simone de Beauvoir. Of course, Simone de Beauvoir is not the first Simone that he encountered, because there was a first Simone that he uh, met and had a relationship, in fact. But let's talk about Simone de Beauvoir. In 1928, Jean Paul plays last, 50th, in his class at the Sorbonne on his aggregation. It's like a final exam, a form of exit exam. The topic of Sartre's paper had been Nietzsche's writings and contingency. And that was difficult for Sartre to accept, to play to place last. Who considered himself smart. However, this failure would serve to be the most important event in his life. He was forced to wait for another examination. And while waiting for the next examination, he met Simone de Beauvoir. Sartre and de Beauvoir were intellectual match. De Beauvoir's the Beauvoir offered Sartre emotional and professional companionship throughout his life. For the next aggregation, the two studied together, and Sartre would place first on the exam this time, and de Beauvoir placed second. Somehow, throughout their life, they've been together, and this is how they are remembered. Together, one right after the other. The love affair of Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre is the most unconventional of relationships. They were never exclusive, both having other lovers at different times in their lives. And the pair never lived together. And definitely marriage was out of the question for both. They never actually married. It represented society's view of relationship, but marriage. According to many sources, they address each other formally as colleagues, more than romantic lovers. They help influence the way the world views the concept of the self and its relation to personal freedom. And together, they challenge the way we view commitments and relationships. Simone de Beauvoir, like Sartre, was responsible for shaping the post-war minds of France and the world. Her book, of course, you know, this very important book, The Second Sex, was frequently being considered the spark that fueled the modern feminist movement of the 1960s. And Sartre and the Beauvoir kept their pact of transparency, being totally open and honest about their lives. These two great minds had the personal resolve and dedication to their to philosophy, and also that they chose to pursue it hand in hand. Now, Sartre's first encounter of phenomenology. One night while in Paris, Sartre and de Beauvoir were drinking with a school friend, Raymond Aron. And in the course of their conversation, 
Aaron mentioned about phenomenology. Obviously, Aaron was studying phenomenology at the time. And Aaron used a beer mug to illustrate phenomenology, discussing the mug's properties and essence by way of the phenomenological method. And Sartre was intrigued. So he began to read about this school of philosophy. And in 1933, John Paul Sartre went to Berlin to study the lectures of Edmund Husserl. After a year, Sartre returned to teaching with new enthusiasm. And when Sartre published the novel Nausea in 1938, he included a phenomenological analysis of a glass of beer in the novel, a tribute to his friend Raymond Aron. When World War II broke up, Sartre was enlisted in the military again. And Saad served in the meteorological service, launching weather balloons. Unfortunately, Saad was captured on June 21, 1940. And while in the Stalag, Saad spent much of his time writing what was to become the book Being and Nothingness. According to one biographer, Sartre neglected himself while in prison, washing rarely, failing to shave, and developing a reputation for being rather foul. Sartre escaped in March 1941, and he managed to return to Paris and somehow returned to his teaching post. Existentialism and Politics In June of 1943, Sartre's anti-Nazi play, The Flies, opened at a Paris theater. And after about 40 performances, it closed, but left quite an impression among the artistic community of Paris. After the war, Sartre found himself famous, and existentialism was the philosophy to his study. Of course, initially, Sartre never wanted the term existentialism, but he became famous for the term and eventually embraced this term existentialism as a description of his philosophy. So up Sartre spread his idea through his editorship of the magazine Le Temps Modern, Modern Times. A publication was named for the Char Charlie Chaplin film Modern Times. If you have What's the silent movie of Charlie Chaplin, The Modern Times? It's a description, it's a portrayal of the modern times, how automatic, how almost like a machine life of the modern times is. Right? We're like robots. As existentialism grew in popularity, Chart slowly left the philosophy that had brought him fame. And Sartre claimed a conversion to Marxism. Such move to the political left was partly influenced by Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And as the Cold War developed, Sartre came to support the Soviet Union. However, his support of Soviet Union cost him of his friendship with Albert Camus, who was, although people considered Camus to be a leftist, but he was not sympathetic to the Soviet. Mr. Camus was a different brand of being a leftist. In 1960, Sartre published his work in defense of Marxism, the critique of dialectical reason. It was meant to be two volumes, but the second was abandoned by Sartre before completion. The unfinished work was published after his death. In the critique, Sartre tried to defend pure Marxism as suspecting individual freedoms. It's a pure Marxism because the Marxism applied or practiced in Russia is very much different, at least in the view of Sartre. Unfortunately, however, for Sartre, most people saw Marxism as it existed 
in the Soviet Union as a system curtailing human freedom. So in 1964, Sartre was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. However, he refused to accept the award on political grounds. Some say on philosophical grounds. Because he does not want to be branded, to be labeled as such and such. That would be bad faith, in the, according to Sartre, based on his philosophy. When you allow people to label you. So in 1968, Paris University students rebelled and called for various reforms. And Sartre's support of the students caused him problems with both the left and the right in France. The right-leaning supporters of President de Gaulle thought Sartre contributed to the protests. The French Communist Party did not support the students, thinking their demands for liberalized education unreasonable. Both the left and the right in France considered the universities fine as they were. So there is no need for the demonstration of the students. Now, the last years of Sartre. From 1968 until his death, Sartre embodied the left, socially and politically. He stopped wearing suits and ties protested the Vietnam War, and found a new following in student radicals in both Europe and America. And by the late 1970s, Jean Paul Sartre's body began to rebel because of his neglect. He smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, drank heavily, and used amphetamines while writing. For all his talk about logic and individual will, Sartre could not stop his bad habits. On April 15, 1980, Sartre died. And Simone de Beauvoir attempted to spend the night next to his body, but hospital employees removed her from his bed. She had loved him since they met to study for the aggregation. And Sartre's popularity might have been diminished by the end of his life, but his death brought forth the kind of emotional displays normally reserved for great political leaders. More than 50,000 people lined the streets of Paris for such funeral procession on, May, on April 19, 1980. Sartre's ashes were buried at the Montparnasse Cemetery. And later, Simone de Beauvoir ashes were buried next to his. That's the life of this genius, I would consider genius, one of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century. Here's a list of his works. Oh, emotion, Outline of a Theory, Transcendence of the Ego, Nausea, Being and Nothingness, The Flies, No Exit, The Age of Reason, Existentialism and Humanism, Anti-Semite, and do the respectable, the respectful prostitute, dirty hands, Saint Genet, the critique of the electrical reason, the family idiot. So just some of his many, many writings. Now let's go to his philosophical influences. I have already mentioned how he encountered phenomenology through his good friend Aaron and he, of course, he went to Berlin to study the lectures of Edmund Husserl. Sartre spent most of his time or his life in Paris. After a traditional philosophical education in the prestigious Parisian schools that introduced him to the history of Western philosophy with a bias towards Cartesianism and Neo-Kantianism, he went to the French Institute in Berlin where he read the leading phenomenologists of the day, Husserl, Heidegger, and Scheller. He appreciated Husserl's restatement of the principle of intentionality. All consciousness is always a consciousness of something that seemed to free the thinker from the inside-outside 
uh, epistemology that was inherited from the philosophy of Descartes. While retaining the immediacy and certainty that Cartesian holds so highly. Just remember that Sartre and Descartes were both friends. And of course, Sartre or Descartes held a great influence on many French thinkers. In his masterwork, Being and Nothingness, Sartre tackles Heidegger's version of Husserlian intentionality by insisting that human reality, what Heidegger called the Dasein, is in the world primarily via its practical concerns and not its epistemic relationships as Husserl intended. I remember that this is the big difference between Husserl and Heidegger. While Heidegger followed the phenomenological approach and attitude of Husserl, he never agreed with Husserl that we should bracket, man should bracket himself from existence. Man, the Dasein, is in the world. So what defines the Dasein is his practical concerns. And this, in this idea, Sartre agreed with Heidegger. This lends both Heidegger's and Sartre's early philosophies a kind of pragmatist. There's a kind of pragmatist character that Sartre at least will never abandon because there is always the practical concern of the Dasein or of man. Sartre may have read the phenomenological ethicist Max Scheller, whose concept of the intuitive grasp of model individuals, remember the uh, the models, the uh, what they call this, the I forgot the term, the uh, somebody remind me the exemplar <laughs> the exemplars no the exemplars okay. the in exemplar the model persons is illustrated in Sartre's reference to the image of the kind of person one should be both guides and is fashioned by moral choices however Scheller following the Scheller idea argues for the discovery of such value or value images. Sartre, on the other hand, insists on their creation, that we need to create. So for who, for Scheller, there is already the ideal exemplar person, and there are historical examples of this. And there are also concrete examples of this. But according to Sartre, we need to create, instead of discovering the values that this exemplars embody, we need to create those values. So here, Sartre's existentialist version of phenomenology is already evident. And in this sense, he aligns himself with Nietzsche, who insisted that we need to create the values ourselves. Sartre was also influenced by Marx's ideas, of course, the second part, or later part of his career, and although he was not a serious reader of Hegel or Marx until during and after the war, he became under the influence of Alexander Kuyeves Marxist and proto existentialist interpretation of Hegel. Kuyeves, Kuyeves was a Russian-born French Marxist philosopher who introduced Hegel into the 20th century French philosophy. But it was Jean Hippolyte's translation of and commentary of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit that marked Sartre's closer study of the seminal German philosopher Hegel. In his last years, Sartre became almost totally blind, well, because of his neglect of his body. Yet he continued to work with the help of a tape recorder producing with Benny Levy portions of a co-authored ethics and published parts of which indicate its value is more biographical than philosophical. After his death, 
thousands, tens of thousands spontaneously joined his funeral cortege in the mem in a memorable tribute to his respect and esteem among the public at large. The headline of one Parisian newspaper lamented, France has lost its conscience, referring to Jean Paul Sartre. Phenomenology and ontology. So let's go now to his philosophy. Sartre's task to was to develop a phenomenological ontology. This is pretty much like Heidegger, one of the most important influences in the philosophy of Sartre was Heidegger. This phenomenological ontology is a study. It aims to study the world, the way the world is revealed through the structures of consciousness. Through the study of the structures of consciousness, Sartre believes that this will provide us with an ontology, which means an account of what the world must be like for experience to be the way it is. So again, ontology here is a description, an account, an analysis of the world, the world as reality. Such philosophy owes much to Heidegger, but there are certain differences between Heidegger and Sartre. For Sartre, the standpoint of human subject is the beginning and the end of his philosophy, which means that he studied the human individual condition for the sake of the meaning of existence of the human individual. So his starting point is man, his end point is man. Starting point is a Dasein, and the end point of his philosophy is the Dasein the meaning of the existence of the Dasein. For Heidegger, however, while the starting point is the Dasein, remember that for Heidegger, we have to ask first about the questioner. Before we can ask the question about being, we need to question the Dasein first. So the starting point is the Dasein. However, it will not end with Dasein or with the human individual. Philosophy must end up with being. Starts with Dasein, ends with being for Heidegger. So for Sartre, human consciousness confronts a totality of being that is alien and meaningless, as Sartre emphasized human willing and action. This thinking goes with it a kind of subjectivism that Heidegger tried to avoid. But for Sartre, we must make our way in the world by subjectively creating meaning rather than having it by letting be, as Heidegger proposed. Remember for Heidegger, let the being show itself. Let it be, Gelassenheit. But according to Sartre, we go about our life subjectively creating meaning instead of just letting the meaning come out. So man subjectively creates meaning for himself. Now, like Husserl and Heidegger, Sartre distinguished ontology from metaphysics and favored ontology. For Sartre, ontology is primarily descriptive and classificatory. Ontology is a description of human existence. Metaphysics, on the other hand, purports to be causally explanatory, offering accounts about the ultimate origins and ends of individuals and of the universe as a whole. So while ontology is descriptive, metaphysics is teleological. It proposes ends, purposes for human existence. Now, such being and nothingness is considered to be the main work, most important work of Sartre. 
is subtitled a phenomenological ontology. So that gives us the very the very aim or objective of Sartre in writing B-A-N or being and nothingness. Its descriptive method moves from the most abstract to the highly concrete. It analyzes two distinct and irreducible categories or kinds of being, the en soi and the por soi. The in itself, en soi, and the for itself, por soi. Roughly can be categorized as non-conscious and conscious, respectively. And then, of course, a third, the poor or three, or for others, the being for others. Being in itself, as Sartre described, applies to the Prince and Soi, and loosely means in self. So it describes the state of being of objects, beings. In the terminology of Heidegger, that these would be the entities, the scientists, the things without self-awareness, without consciousness. Such being in itself represents the idea that only concrete phenomena have any ontological status. Meaning they are permanent, they are fixed. Only concrete is real. Husserl's approach to phenomenology was embraced by Sartre as a basis for existential exploration. To simplify this concept, Sartre might state that a rock is a rock and it cannot change what it is. So, in this manner, Sartre suggests there is facticity or truth in the existence of some objects or objects themselves. Facticity, meaning it is already a being, complete, finished, defined, concrete. That is the ensoi. What about the porsoi? In contrast to in itself or en soi, Sartre proposed the for itself. It is a state of self-awareness and control. So this for soi is conscious. It is aware of itself. It can control itself. According to Kaufman, the difference thus, the for soi for itself is that being which is aware of itself. It has consciousness. And that is man. Man, the Dasein, is a for soi because it is conscious. It is aware of itself. Now, Sartre's being for itself describes human consciousness as possessing the characteristics of incompleteness and potency different from the ensoi, which is already complete and actual, existing, finished, fixed. So this for, for, for soi or for itself is indeterminate. It has an indeterminate structure. The absence of a creator, God, leaves man without a predefined nature. So without a nature, Individuals are nothingness. They are nothing. By nothing, they are not they are not defined. And they can define themselves. They can become. In effect, the essence of man is a complete lack of everything. It is not fixed, it's not finished, unlike objects. So nothingness. Sartre thought was freedom and free will. We will create out of this nothingness, out of our freedom, our own existence, our own meaning, our own essence. 
So applying this definition of nothingness to individuals, mankind is freedom. Freedom in the sense that it will be man because he is nothing. It will be man who will define himself. He is freedom. So Sart contended that not only was the individual free, but the essence of mankind was freedom. Man is freedom. Freedom defines his essence. So as a result of this freedom, individuals are responsible for all their actions and thoughts. Because of our freedom, we create our own essence. We exist and create our own essence. And because we are the creator of our own essence, we are the creator, originator of our thoughts and actions, then we are fully responsible for them. Since we are the creators of ourselves, we are fully responsible for ourselves. And so according to Sard, I am responsible for everything except for my very responsibility, for I am not the foundation of my being. Therefore, everything takes place as if, we're, as if I were compelled to be responsible. I am abandoned in the world in the sense that I find myself suddenly alone and without help, engaged in a world for which I bear the whole responsibility without being able. Whatever I do, to tear myself away from this responsibility for an instant. That's a quote from being and nothingness. So only the in itself is conceivable as substance or thing. The for itself is nothing. By nothing meaning it is not defined. It is the internal negation of things. The principle of identity holds only for the being in itself. The being in itself and the for itself have mutually exclusive characteristics. The in itself is solid, self-identical, passive, and inert. It simply is. It's actual, is. The for itself is fluid, non-self, non-identical, and dynamic. And it is the internal negation or nihilation of the in itself in which it depends. So viewed more concretely, this duality is cast as facticity and transcendence. The in itself is facticity, the for itself is transcendence. Human beings are entities that combines both, which is the ontological root of our ambiguity. But don't dismiss this nothingness, because it is by nothingness that man actually becomes. Out of this nothingness, man becomes somebody because of his freedom. So the givens of our situations like our language, our environment, our previous choices, and even our very selves in their function as in itself constitutes our facticity. Facticity are the given. Those things that we cannot change, or at least have not been modified by us. But as conscious individuals, as Poussois, we transcend, we surpass this facticity in what constitutes our situations. In other words, we are beings in situation. But the precise mixture of transcendence and facticity that forms any situation remains indeterminable. Well, at least while we are engaged in it. The Forsard concludes that we are always more than our situation. There's always more. We are always more than the situation because we always look beyond 
the future, what can become out of our situation. So this is the ontological foundation of our freedom. We are condemned to be free. We cannot but be free. Free to create our own essence out of our situations. So the category or ontological principle of the for others, so that's the third, the third one, comes into play as soon as the other subject or other appears to us. And they always appear to us. The other cannot be deduced from the two previously or previous principles, but must be encountered. This is illustrated by Sartre's analysis of shame. One experience at being discovered in an embarrassing situation. Discovered by others. So such situation carries the immediacy and the certainty of our perception of other minds. So the Ootrui corresponds to the mid-sign, the idea of mid-sign of Heidegger. Now, the meaning of existence before essence. Sartre is responsible for the dictum that existentialism is best known for. Existence precedes essence. Of course, this idea of existence precedes essence, existence and essence have a different definition from the Aristotelian concepts. Now remember that for existentialists, only man exists. Okay, only man exists. Heidegger insisted that only man exists in the sense that only man can stand out of his own existence and evaluate his own existence. Man has consciousness. And man can stand out of itself and be conscious of itself. Therefore, man's existence is different from other objects in the world. The essence of a thing is a set of its defining properties. However, for start, an entity's essence precedes its existence only if it is a manufactured object or article. <clears throat> so with respect to such article or object, we can inquire what is it or what is it for? So imagine you enter a factory or a carpenter shop and you see there you encounter the different objects produced by the carpenter. Now you can ask the carpenter, what is this for? Or say you find yourself in the shop of a sculptor and you ask, what is this that he is trying to do, create? So in his mind, there is already a blueprint. The architect has a blueprint. These blueprints are examples of how essences are created. And therefore, their essences precede them. Their essence precedes their existence because their essence have already been pre-crafted. They've been created for them. But for human beings, it is different. There's no such blueprint. There's no such exemplary idea of how we should be or how we will be or how we are or what we will be. So Sartre was clear in his description. And he writes, it means that first of all, man exists turns up, appears on the scene, and only afterwards defines himself. 
So we exist first, and then we define our own essence. So our essence is not something that has been predetermined, pre-crafted. We exist, and then we will craft, we will create our own essence. And that's why we are fully responsible for whatever we will become. So man exists first and gradually creates and defines his own essence. Therefore, start is stressed. Man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. Such is the principle, the first principle of existentialism. Man first exists. That is, man, first of all, is the being who hurls himself toward the future and who is conscious of imagining himself as being in the future. This is somehow similar to the projection of Heidegger. So, rather than being an essence, man is a structureless phenomenon of consciousness in the world. As a consciousness, as a for itself, is man is purely transparent, volatile self-projection, continually negating the staticity, the structure, and the heaviness of the in itself. Man, at the start, is a plan which is aware of itself. Nothing exists prior to this plan. So after this plan, man will create his own essence. And therefore, for Sartre, nothing at the core of our personhood or the person defines what or who he is. We cannot describe someone as naturally selfish, or aggressive, or good, or social, rational, nor assigns a universal essence for him. One is social only when he chooses to engage in social activities. But he does not define what or who he is. And that while, other, while there is no universal human nature, there is a universal human condition. There is a universal human situation. We all face the same challenges, the same questions, the same limitations. But within those existential structures, we respond in our own unique way. Based on our freedom, of course. Let's go now to the situation. <clears throat> so, situation. Uh, existentialism is stressed that, or well, stressed the situated character of our existence. And what is this situation for Sartre? He said, situation is my position in the midst of the world, defined by the relation between the instrumental utility or adversity in the in the realities which surround me and my facticity so let me explain this uh this instrumental utility or adversity in the realities that surround me this is similar to the uh idea of heidegger about being thrown into the world alongside other entities okay so that, that is our situation. We are amongst, we are uh, alongside objects, other entities. Okay. And then, of course, my facticity. So my facticity, we have already defined facticity as the givens, the pre-givens. You know? Those things that, are, that were not determined by us. Okay, so there are things that are fixed from the outside. So situation is defined by those instrumental, by the objects that surround us, plus 
the givens of our existence. So that's your situation, your position in the midst of the world. So for example, your situation will be, let's say you are born and raised in the slum area, or if you are raised and born in a war-torn area, or if you are raised and born in the, let's say, in a place, na, well, you are part of the nobility, for example, that's your situation. Okay. Now, some of these you may consider to be constraints. But according to Sartre, situation cannot be considered as a set of constraints to which man is subject. Situation stems from the illumination of constraints by freedom, which give it the meaning or its meaning as constraints. Meaning, it will be our situation will be constraints if we give it a meaning of constraints. So he said, but precisely because I project myself toward an end across a world of relations, I now meet the consequences with linked series, with complexes, and I must determine to act according to laws. These laws, in the way I make use of them, decide the failure and or success of my attempts. But it is through freedom that lawful relations come into the world. Does freedom in change itself in the world as a free project towards an end? In other words, you are free. So you are free to consider your constraints, the laws, for example, okay, as constraints. So if you are born, for example, in the Islam, but you don't consider you as freedom, you don't consider this as constraints, then they will not be constraints. If you are born of into the nobility, but you consider, regardless whether you are well off because you're a noble, but because of the restrictions, because of the enormous responsibility of being a noble, if you consider those responsibilities as constraints, then they will be constraints. So again, it is man who defines what will be constraints or not for him. So Sartre emphasized that it is useless to talk about action without cause or end or motive, for there cannot be any action without cause or motive. And such does not concern the question of freedom. Okay, And although there is no act which does not have any motive or cause, it is the act which decides its ends and motives, and the act is the expression of freedom. So in other words, sometimes, of course, you always think, why are... Why I am doing this? What is my purpose? Okay. What is my motive for doing this? According to Sartre, there's no, there's no use talking that because there will always be a cause or motive. But that is not the concern of freedom. The concern of freedom is I'm doing this because it's my decision, regardless of this will be the purpose or this will be the end. So the very act of doing something decides the ends of the or the motive of the act. Okay. So it's not about what will be the purpose of my action. Main concern is my action is something that I have determined. It is an expression of my freedom. Therefore, for Sartre, although maintaining that there is always a situation from which man chooses. Its influence upon man's freedom is inconsequential because the past has no effect on man's choices. Man does not choose in the light of past choices because people will say, well, I, I'm making my choice because my making my choice now because of what happened before. But for Sartre, for him, every moment is, every act is in the moment. Huh? So, that's that's uh <clears throat> for for him the past will not be consequential because you always live make the choice make the act express your freedom in the moment now let's talk about human freedom more in details <clears throat> when instantialists talk about freedom they prefer or refer to personal freedom okay that is the power of the person over his actions over his person over his own self 
the person has the capacity to determine his action and his self. Man as a subject determines himself. It is he who creates his personality. So you exist first and then create your own essence. He's the product of his own decision. He cannot be the product of any form of determination, whether social, economic, or biological. So this is sometimes to call people would regard this as absolute freedom, but it's not absolute freedom in the sense that you can do whatever you want. It's absolute freedom because it's freedom from the very beginning. Okay. From the very beginning that you're trying to create your own self, your own person. Sartre asserts that it is through freedom that, my, that man defines his essence. Freedom makes possible the essence of man. And man cannot escape this freedom. That's why he is condemned to freedom. Human freedom precedes essence in man. Before we can be this kind of person, there is freedom first. Okay? So, receives his essence and then makes it possible, meaning makes possible the essence. The essence of the human being is suspended in his freedom. What we call freedom is impossible to distinguish from the being of human reality. Man's essence is freedom and we cannot distinguish his being and freedom his being is free is freedom he does not exist and then later on becomes free according to Sartre, man does not exist first in order to be free subsequently there's no difference between the being of man and his being free so the essence of man is freedom there's no way that man can get out, can escape this freedom. Now, how does Sartre explain the relation of the past to man's future or present? Sartre said that the meaning of the past is strictly dependent on my present project. In other words, when I look at the past, I will always judge the past based on the present. So whether the past is good or bad, it will depend on me. I will. I will, so if it is good, it's good because I consider it to be good. If it is bad, I can. It is bad because I consider it to be bad. Okay. This means that the fundamental project, which is I am the present, decides absolutely the meaning which the past can have for me, and for others. I alone decide at its moment the significance of the past by projecting myself towards my ends i preserve the past with me and by action i decide its action okay so the past will only have its meaning of being good bad or whatever depending on how at this moment i consider the past to be so if i consider to my past as constraints then there will be constraints but if I consider the past as opportunities, then the past will be opportunities. All right, now let's go to responsibility. Because of this great emphasis on freedom, Sartre declared that man is condemned to be free and he carries the whole world on his shoulders. He is responsible for the world and for himself as a way of being. So, responsibility is the twin of freedom because by by freedom we create our own essence then we have to be responsible for our own essence because of our freedom we are the uncontestable author of an event and of ourselves, and therefore we are accountable for it that's why according to Sartre, sometimes some people when when they receive when they realize this freedom they tremble because the responsibility is put squarely on their shoulders man must assume the situation with a proud consciousness of being the author of it for it acquires meaning only in and through his project it is senseless therefore to complain since nothing alien has decided what we felt or what we live 
or what we are. So in this sense, the responsibility of the for itself is overwhelming since he's the one by whom it happens that there is a world. Responsibility then is the logical consequence of freedom. See? Now, bad faith and authenticity. Sartre warns us against the trap of labeling ourselves, for this only denies our freedom. One may say, I am conservative, or this or that. And people can put labels on others by referring to them as this kind of person or that kind of leader or that kind of person. Labels become our identity only because we make them so. So when we allow other people to label us, then we become what they think we are. If we allow them to label us. The attempt to deny our freedom is called by Sartre as bad faith. In bad faith, we see ourselves as products of our circumstances. So we regard our situation as the one that determines who we are. That's bad faith. Or the attempt to identify ourselves with our past choices while closing off our future. So when you say, I am this because of my past, that's also labeling. Okay. So in bad faith, we become an in itself. Okay. We become closed. We become fixed. A being that is defined or has fixed identity. As free individuals, we must exercise our freedom and create or invent our own essences. That's the meaning of authenticity for Sartre. So for Sartre, only when we take our responsibility for the meaning of our past and present and subconsciously choose our future will we achieve authenticity. Authenticity is the true value in an otherwise valueless universe. So it's up to man to give authenticity or give value to himself. Right. Now, let's go to the notion of God and Sartre. Notion, Sartre's notion of God can be summarized into these propositions. God as a perfect being is a contradiction. The idea of God as creator denies man of the opportunity to create his own essence through freedom. Consequently, the affirmation of God's existence would negate the recognition of man's freedom. And therefore, God's existence must be denied. So for Sartre, human freedom and God's existence are contradictories. You cannot accept them both as true. It's either God, man is free or God exists. So this notion of God is contained in this basic principle, number one. That God as the perfect being is a contradiction in itself. Sartre conceived God as a perfect being. And such a being can only be one who is at the same time and in itself and a for itself. And in soi and for soi. This follows from the idea of Sartre that there are only two beings, the in itself and the for itself, to be perfect. The in itself is full and massive. It manifests perfection and fullness of being. However, it is unconscious and the for itself is conscious and ontologically emerges from the in itself. It is fundamentally a lack of being and insufficient. This very lack is expressed in desire. God to be perfect must have the same qualities of the in itself and the for itself. But such combination is impossibility. For God cannot be both conscious and unconscious. He cannot be both fullness of being and lack of being. That's the idea of God as a perfect being is a contradiction. Of course, you're going to say, does that not apply to man also? Is man also a contradiction in itself? But remember that for Sartre, he's not saying that man is a perfect being. What he's saying is that man 
in some sense, is porswa, and in another sense, it's also an in itself. He's not saying that he's a perfect combination of the two. But the idea of God is a perfect combination of these two beings, which for Sartre is a contradiction. Next is the idea of God as a superior artisan. Sartre also described God, the creator, as a superior artisan. In the factory, he said, the manufacturer already has an idea of every object that he creates. Thus, every object in his shop follows exactly what he has in mind. God is like this manufacturer or a superior artisan or a sculptor. As a superior artisan, when he creates, he knows exactly what he is creating. Thus, he said, the concept of man in the mind of God is comparable to the concept of a paper cutter in the mind of the manufacturer. Thus, the individualized man is the realization of a certain concept in the divine intelligence. When God created man, he knows exactly the nature of man. And man cannot be but what God created him to be. Now, Sartre opposed such view. God as a superior artisan. Because to accept God as a creator is to derive or deprive man of the opportunity to create himself. If God exists as a superior artisan, then man will not be free to create his own essence. But if God does not exist, there's nobody to define human nature. There will be no fixed human essence, and man would be free to create his own essence. It is therefore necessary to deny God's existence. He said, if God does not exist, there is at least one being in whom existence precedes essence. A being who exists before he can be defined by any concept. And that this being is man. Now, let's take a look at this kind of atheism of Sartre. What influenced Sartre to be an atheist? And this is actually a question one of your questions no? is he an atheist did he said he's an atheist what triggered this atheistic stand he find we find the answer in his autobiography le monde the words from his autobiography we see that just like any existentialist whose philosophy was very much influenced by his experiences and personal life Sartre's, philo Sartre's philosophical stance on God was affected by his early experiences and his personal life. First of all, Sartre did not experience a truly Christian life. His grandfather, Charles Schweitzer, used to ridicule Catholicism. And his mother, while not approving the later uh, attitude on Catholicism, tolerated it. In his autobiography, the words, Sartre admitted that he prayed, although he got bored with the holy. So he wrote, I am in my night shirt, kneeling on bed with my hands together. I said my prayers every day, but I thought of God less and less often. Sartre's denial of God stems mainly from his childhood experiences, especially on the fact that his elders introduced to him the kind of God that he never needed. He recounted that he was longing for the God who made him for his glory, but he could not recognize such God in the fashionable God that was introduced to him. He was looking for a creator, but instead, he was introduced to a big boss. And for Sartre, the big, the personification of this big boss was actually his grandfather, Charles Schweitzer. So again, in the Limon, he said, I felt myself superfluous. Therefore, therefore, I had to disappear. The more absurd life was, 
the less bearable was death. I reached out for religion. I longed for it. It was the remedy. Had it been denied to me, I would have invented it myself. Raised in the Catholic faith, I learned that the Almighty had made me for His glory. That was more than I dared dream. But later, I did not recognize in the fashionable God in whom I was told to believe the one whom my soul was awaiting. I needed a creator. I was given a big boss. And the two were one. But I did not realize it. I was serving without zeal the idol of the Pharisees. So the kind of God that he encountered in his early life was like his grandfather, a big boss, who would look at him in a very strange manner that the only fitting reaction is one of rebellion. So this is another imagery of the other. The, 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 the stare of the other is hell because the other always looks at us in a very strange manner. Uh, said, imagine if you, you are caught in an embarrassing situation by the other. How would you feel? So again, in his autobiography, Sartre describes it this way. For several years, I kept up public relations with the Almighty. In private, I stopped associating with him. Only once I had a feeling that he existed. I had been playing with matches, malit pa siya, no? and had burned a mat. I was busy covering up my crime when suddenly God saw me. The God that saw him, actually that's the grandfather. I felt his gaze inside my head and on my hands. I turned round and round in the bathroom, horribly visible, a living target. I was saved by indignation. I grew angry at such a crude lack of tact and blasphemed, muttering like my grandfather, Sacre nom de Dieu, de nom de Dieu, de nom de Dieu. He never looked at me again. God damn it, God damn it. Something like that. Therefore, much of Sartre's negative attitude towards religion and God were influenced and triggered by his experience, which he called misunderstanding or a mistake or an accident. Again, he said, when someone or when anyone speaks to me about him today, about God, I say with easy amusement of an old bow who meets a former bell. Fifty years ago, had it not been for that misunderstanding, that mistake, the accident that separated us, there might have been something between us. Well, there you go. If Sartre carried on his denial of God to the end, even though it is not demonstrated apodictically, it is because it is necessary. Necessary both philosophically for his philosophical stance on freedom and personally for nothing will change if one denies God. So that ends my presentation on philosophy of Sartre.